Good morning. Let's stand together and let's sing the hymn, Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on high. to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table. Good morning. morning. Wonderful to see everyone today. Thank you for coming and worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We can't wait to hear from the Callum family in just a few minutes. Um, If you would look on the back of your sheet. You know, we're supposed to be having an abbreviated service, so that's why we're having the sheets instead of the bulletins. <laughs> but I wanted you to make sure you see number two. That's a new item uh, of announcement that we need to know about. The Stewardship Committee is asking us to get our budget request in by the 4th. And then uh, look at number five, the children's ministry. Last Wednesday we had eight. This past Wednesday we had 12. So the Lord is just blessing us with the the children and the workers, uh, they're meeting outside, and uh, so everything is safe, and we sterilize everything that they use, so uh, just still keep praying uh, for the children, and the youth meet tonight, they're meeting on Sunday night, so if you would, be in prayer for, for them, and the others are, are there from last week, but just make sure you're, you're reading them. I did want to give you a quick update on the prayer walk. Uh, that we had Thursday morning here at the church. We had 11 uh, members to join us, and LT had swept out the fellowship hall, and we went out and used the fellowship hall, the actual voting site where they're going to be doing the voting. And we just prayed for God's blessings upon us and upon the building and upon uh, our nation uh, in this, these next few weeks to come. So I just want to give you a quick update. Let's have a, let's have a prayer time together. Father, again, we thank you for giving us a new day, this beautiful sunny day, this this fall day that we just see your hand, your creative power, the cooler temperatures, and and we just thank you that that you're in control, and, and that no matter where we are, we are never alone, and no matter what we experience, we are never alone. We know that our church members are are having some issues that they need to face, and we pray for their their strength and their comfort to know of your your presence with them. For our church members that are traveling away this weekend, may they be safe as they are returning to us. And help us to remember, too, 
Holy Spirit, that yesterday is gone. Whatever the regrets and mistakes, failures we've experienced, they're gone. And if we go to live in tomorrow, uh, we're just going to get anxious and worried and concerned. And today, on this day, is the day that we find your grace. And I pray that, that you give us the strength to enjoy all of your grace this day. And we pray in the very strong name of Jesus. Amen. So the Kellams are going to come and lead us now. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I just want to take this time to thank Miss Margaret for inviting us here this morning to sing for y'all. And as you know, we are the Kellam family. <laughs> and you can best believe we're all Kellams. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, since we will be on, on Facebook, I want to introduce the, the family to you. On my far right is my brother Steve. Next to him is my sister Beulah. In the middle is my sister Cookie. <laughs> and this is my lovely wife Dorothy. And as everybody knows, I'm Kenny Man. <laughs> Every single day No matter how I try To stay out of his way Our little game of hide and seek Would still be going on But I found the perfect hiding place And I'm making it my home I'm hidden by the cross, hidden by the cross, behind those holy timbers where Jesus paid the cost. I'm under his protection and grace that can be bought, and the devil cannot find me. While I'm hidden by the cross I know the devil wants me To come back out and play So he can feel my weakness and lead my soul astray. I'm where he can reach me now. There's nothing he can do. And if he still wants to play, he'll have to find somebody new. I'm hidden by the cross, hidden by the cross. Behind those holy tempers Where Jesus made the call I'm under his protection And grace that can't be bought And the devil cannot find me While I'm hidden by the cross I'm under his protection and grace that can't be bought. And the devil cannot find me while I'm hidden by the cross. Living in a troubled world, 
seems this day and time. People searching everywhere for peace they cannot find. I'm just a simple man, but there's one thing I found. Trusting in the Lord has turned my life around. When you call, when you call on Him, Jesus will forgive you and become your dearest friend. When you call, when you call on Him, old things will pass away, a new life will begin. When you call on Him In your darkest hour When you're lost and all alone Friends have all forsaken And it seems all hope is gone When you trust in Jesus From that moment you believe all your sins he'll wash away and pardon you receive when you call when you call on him Jesus will forgive you and become your dearest friend when you call when you will begin when you call on Him. When you call, when you call on Him, Jesus will forgive you and become your dearest friend. When you call, when A new life will begin when you call on Him. When you call. Thank you. Thank you, Callum family. Oh my goodness, that was beautiful. I can't, I can't wait to get to heaven so I can sing when I get there. I can't sing here, but I hope to sing there. So. Uh, that is truly an inspiration. Thank you so very much for blessing us. Well, let's take our Bibles, if we will, and turn to our parallel scripture reading from Psalm 50. And so I was sitting there listening to them sing and how uh, the scriptures today, the message, everything goes right along together about calling on the Lord and how we're going to have a talk with Jesus through the nobleman and how the nobleman called on the Lord in his time of need. So let's begin with Psalm uh, 50, verses 14 through 15. Offer unto God thanksgiving, and pay thou vows unto the Most High, and call upon him in the day of trouble, and I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. And I offer Tory prayer now. Let's, let's pray together. Father, again, we just pause to thank you that you, you are the maker of all of creation. And the offerings that we bring here at church during our special worship services, the offerings that we send in, that we bring by, truly they are the fruits of our labors but are generated by your grace and mercy. 
You have given us your best. May we look upon our giving as our best. And if it's not quite our best, I pray your Holy Spirit will stir our our spirits that we will offer ourselves to you, working together in your fields. And we pray now that these gifts might be used to to bless others who need to call on the Lord for their eternal life. We trust in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together for a doxology. You know it, a family went to church for the first time, went to Sunday school. When they got back home, the son said, Dad, I need to ask you a question about Sunday school. Dad said, okay, sure. So the son said, well, today in Sunday school, the teacher was reading the Bible, all about the children of Israel building the temple and the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea and the children of Israel were making sacrifices. Well, Dad, didn't the grown-ups do anything? <laughs> you know? so, uh, today our, our nobleman did something for his son. <laughs> he took part in his son's care. Absolutely. So in today's sermon, as we continue our series on talking with Jesus, we come to the Roman nobleman, the official. Uh, This nobleman was a father uh, who had a son that was dying. We don't know the nature of the illness. The Bible doesn't doesn't share that. Uh, It doesn't matter to Jesus what the illness was. But he had a, a high fever that evidently brought him to the point of death, We don't know the son's name. The mother's not mentioned, but we certainly can only imagine that she was there beside her son. I'd imagine she stayed beside him while uh, this nobleman went to talk with Jesus. And I think really that's probably one of the deepest fears that any parent or or grandparent would, would have 
someday an accident involving their child or grandchild or an illness that would, would take them away. And, and I, I think that the one thing parents want to know is, is my child all right? And I think until the age of accountability, absolutely they are in the arms of Jesus. And I think that when they become old enough to know Jesus as their personal Savior and Lord, anything happens to them, they are safe in the arms of Jesus, just as you and I would be safe in his arms. And I think our parallel scripture uh, that shows us from verses 14 and 15 that there's two responses that the Lord encourages us to do, to call upon him. As the Kellams were, were singing, you know, as the Satan was attacking, that when they gave their life to Jesus, how they were able to, to withstand him. So the Lord, through our parallel scripture, wants us to call on him in our time of trouble. And when we call on him, then he wants us to glorify him. Two steps. Don't just call and say, oh God, I need relief. It's, Lord, help me. I glorify your name and all that you do and say. And so that's, I believe, is what this nobleman is showing us uh, that Jesus will be teaching us today. He came to Jesus, pleading with Jesus. He didn't just walk up and say, I, I got a sick son. How about, how about take care of him? Uh, he would, one thing we need to know, that this nobleman would have never gone to speak to someone he would send servants. They would send servants on their behalf to, to speak and to carry on the wishes of the family, of this nobleman. But he himself has come now. He's the one that stepped out. He didn't send servants. He came directly to Jesus. Is that not a story for us right there? That you and I can ask our friends to pray for us, but it comes down to you and to me going directly to Jesus Christ with our needs. You see, last week we looked at the Good Samaritan, but the lawyer was testing Jesus to see if, if Jesus would agree with, with his own interpretation of love of neighbor. Well, he was sent by the high priest. The, the Old Testament priest would send these lawyers to do their bidding for them. Sometimes you might think of people who think a little too highly of themselves. Do you know people that think a little too much of themselves? Thank you. I'm glad you didn't name them. Thank you. <laughs> and they have other people to do the work for them, but they want to make sure that, that they get the recognition. This nobleman, he didn't care about that. He came himself pleading with Jesus. Let's take our Bibles, turn to John chapter 4, at verse 46. If you brought your Bibles, I know there aren't any in the pews, but I hope you brought yours with you from home. John chapter 4 beginning at verse 46. So Jesus came again, second time, into Cana of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine. Remember the wedding? That's, that's what he was referring to. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. Now, I, I believe that, that when life is, is going well, it, it's easy to kind of forget about God. But boy, when life starts tumbling in all around us and suddenly it gets just too overwhelming for us that we start then looking to heaven for, for help. This, this nobleman who comes from Capernaum up into Galilee, up, up into Cana, was a royal official. Uh, the Greek says that, that he served kings, meaning he was an official government uh, representative of of Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch there of Galilee and, and Perea. He was a, a Roman appointed official. No doubt that he was a, a powerful, influential man, custom of having his orders uh, carried out. In this society, in this day and time, according to the Roman government, he would have been higher ranked than Jesus because they didn't recognize Jesus. People came to this nobleman to have their problems solved. Now he has a problem, and he can't solve it. Have you ever felt that way? That you're just so stunned that you don't know what to do. You don't know how to take care of this issue. 
It could be a death issue, a financial issue, a, a, a physical issue, a spiritual issue. We don't know how to solve it. And beloved, it's no matter how much money we have or what positions that we hold in society or, or what positions that we hold in the church, we are never, we never reach the place where we are protected from trouble. Chuck Swindoll reminded me, he said, enjoy it while it's good because it lasts about three to four months and then the next trouble comes. He's also the one that told me enjoy my wedding pictures. That was the smallest I was ever going to be in life. And <laughs> I'd certainly agree with him there. <laughs> but the, the son being sick, this nobleman couldn't do anything. Even if it was his son, he was powerless, helpless. But I think about this. If the son hadn't been sick, then this nobleman may have never had a conversation with Jesus. He may never have met Jesus himself. God uses our troubles to bring us to him. So let's look at the request that he makes. In verse 47 now. When he, that's the nobleman, heard that Jesus was come out of Judah into Galilee. Remember, we looked at that. Judah's down in the southern part of the nation of Israel, the territory. And then you had Samaria. Then you had Galilee up at, the, at north, up around the, the Sea of Galilee. So Jesus had left Judah and come up into Galilee. On the way, he had met the woman at the well. And so he, this nobleman, went to him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. See, by this time, Jesus is, is pretty well known there in, in Galilee. Not, not long before he, this miracle was going to take place, he had turned the, the water uh, into wine at the wedding there. The word had spread that this, this carpenter from Nazareth had the power to heal sick, so multitudes of people were coming uh, to him. And he healed multitudes of people. The Bible says we have these illustrations as enough to draw us to Jesus for faith. But he did much, much more than, than what's recorded here. So when the nobleman heard that Jesus had come to Cana, he makes a plan to, to go and to talk with Jesus, to explain to Jesus how this son was sick, and to ask Jesus to, to leave Cana and to come down to uh, to Galilee, uh, to Capernaum there. Because, see, this tells us he, he really doesn't know the full power of Jesus. He could have sent his servants to Jesus, but he knows Jesus' reputation, and that's enough to motivate him to get up and to go, to personally go and to plead for his loved one. This is a faith formula. Let's make note of this. He doesn't know what's going to happen, but he goes anyway. That's faith. He doesn't know, but he goes. Faith does not know the future, but faith steps out anyway. Capernaum, if you're looking at your Bible map there, it's look at the Sea of Galilee and look at 12 o'clock up at the top of the Sea of Galilee, and just over just a little bit from around 11 o'clock or thereabouts, you'd see Capernaum right there on the, on the coast, coast of the Sea of Galilee. That's where Jesus and his disciples made their, their home uh, in, the, in the Galilean region. And just about 22 miles up into the hills uh, around the, the Sea of Galilee is, is the city of, of Cana. And that's where Jesus is. He has gone this 22 miles to plead with Jesus to come. Uh, desperation turned this powerful Roman nobleman into a beggar. And I can just imagine this powerful man is, is down on his knees in front of Jesus, begging him to come and heal his son. Beloved, even, even a skeptic will pray at a time like this. I can tell you from experience, you know, an atheist has no need of God. I haven't met an atheist in the emergency room. No, not there. Everybody wants a little bit of extra help there. 
Only God could help comfort this man and his sick child, these parents. And only God can help you and me in our times of trouble. That's what the Kellams were singing. That's what the psalmist was telling us. That's what this parable, uh, this, this, this encounter is about. Notice that, that he believes that, that for Jesus to do this miracle, to heal his son, he has to leave Cana up here in the hills and come down to Capernaum. He can't do it from up there in Cana. That's 22 miles away. He's got to come home with him. Oh, really? Well, let's pick up at verse 48. Then Jesus said unto him, Except ye see signs and wonders, ye believe not. The nobleman said unto him, Sir, come down, ere my child die. Jesus is putting the nobleman's faith to a test. Jesus never tempts us to sin. Jesus never tempts us to sin. Satan does that. But Jesus will test us to grow us, to make us stronger, making us more dependent on him. Look at what Jesus said. Are you still coming here just because you want a sign? You, you want another miracle? Do you not really know who I am? Jesus' power is not limited by geography. If Jesus was limited by geography, he'd only be here in our church this morning. He wouldn't be at Union or he wouldn't be at any other church, would he? But he's not limited. He has no limits. You know, we say many times, seeing is believing. But that's backwards. Faith must always come before miracle. Miracles are not just for our relief. They are designed to point us to Jesus, to focus our faith on Jesus. Miracles last a short while. Faith carries us into heaven. Faith is what carries us to heaven. So how does this nobleman address Jesus? If you would, look, look at verse 49. This Roman official, this higher ranking official than Jesus would be in society, addresses Jesus very humbly. He calls him sir. Sir. Meaning, I bow to you, Jesus. There was nothing wrong with the man's plan to go to Jesus. But it wasn't Jesus' plan. Jesus has a much bigger plan for this nobleman and all of those that are around listening to him. Look at verse 50. Jesus says unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him. And he went his way. The man said, come down to Capernaum and Jesus says go Max Licato helped me remember this this week when I was reading some of his devotions Jesus is saying I'm here I care you're never alone and we need to be reminded of that I think when we're facing these difficult days I'm finding that more and more people are having emotional issues because I think of the limitations that are being placed on us, but for other reasons too. And we need to remind ourselves and others that we are never alone. Jesus is always with us. I think the Holy Spirit spoke to this nobleman's heart at this verse and said, trust the words of Jesus. And how do we know that? The nobleman trusted. There, there are two miracles taking place here for us today. One miracle is the easy miracle. The son was healed. Jesus says, go, your son lives. That's all that had to be said. The second miracle was the miracle of faith in this nobleman's heart. That's in your heart, in my heart, when we believed in Jesus. And I, I just can only imagine it. I'm wondering if it was a little difficult, if it was hard for the nobleman had his plan to go get Jesus and bring him down because everybody does what the nobleman says. But Jesus says, you're going back home. Your son will live. 
and he's going back home. He's, he's going that 22 miles out of the hill country, back down to the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum by himself. His plan didn't work the way he wanted it to work out, but he goes anyway. That's faith in the words of Jesus. No signs, nothing visible that he can hold on to and to see, just the words of Jesus, go. Do you and I have that faith? Do you and I act on the words of Jesus? How many times have we prayed and taken our burden to the cross of Christ? And we've said amen, and as we're stepping away, we reach back and grab that burden and put it back on us. And we keep walking. Oh, Lord, why God? Oh, God, help me. <laughs> well, you, you're supposed to leave it with him. That's faith. That's faith. And then we trust him as we go about doing what he's asked us to do to be our part of that burden lifting. So here comes the confirmation now. Let's look at verse 51, 52. And as he was now going down, going back home to Capernaum, just before he got there, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend, to feel better. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. Is the father thinking, could the words of Jesus really be true? Do you think, can Jesus really heal our troubles? I don't see Jesus, but can he really take care of what I'm praying for? As he got a little closer to home, just try to imagine this. He's, he's coming down the road and he's coming close to his, to his home and he hears a celebration. His heart is... Is concerned. His, his mind is churning. Is it really true? Jesus told me to go, and I'm going. And all of a sudden, he hears laughter. He hears excitement. As he gets closer, the servants run out to meet him. And, and they say they're filled with joy and telling him that his son's alive. And the nobleman says, well, when did it happen? Tell me everything. And they said, Master... He didn't just start getting better. It was boom, all at once he was healed. And what time was that? The seventh hour, one o'clock yesterday afternoon. That's when Jesus spoke to me. That's what Jesus told me to do, to go home. It was one o'clock in the afternoon. That's the miracle of Jesus' spoken word. 22 miles away, and Jesus healed him with a spoken word. See, it proves that Jesus is the Lord over time and over distance. Wherever you are, wherever I am in my life, Jesus can handle what we are going through. The nobleman believed. Then he saw the results. Look at the commitment that followed after this. Verse 53. So the father, notice he doesn't call him the nobleman now, he's back to being a father. The father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. This is again the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judah into Galilee. Beloved, there are three times, or three, three different times, we could say, when Jesus, uh, when, when we have faith in Jesus, that it, that it grows. There, there are three different occasions when this nobleman, this father's faith, grew to a higher level. He believed once he came to Cana that Jesus could heal him. This nobleman had the first level of faith in miracles. That's... That's a level of faith, but that's a, that's a shallow level. Then he believed again when he left to go home. That's faith in the words of Jesus. Then he believed ultimately when his son was healed. That's faith in Jesus Christ himself. He believed so fully 
that he swept his whole family into belief in Jesus. And all of his servants, they all became part of the kingdom. So when we read later on that, that when Jesus was crucified and dead and risen the third day and then ascended back into heaven and it's just the disciples that are left trying to organize the church and the word began to scatter and to spread throughout all the land, it's probably from one of these noblemen's testimonies that helped spread the word, to help build up the kingdom. Beloved, faith is a gift that grows as we use it. Faith is a gift that grows as we use it. Let's use our faith right now. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I pray that you reveal to us that this story is about the sovereign hand of God. Though the Father could not see it in advance, his Son was brought to the point of death that the entire family, that the entire household might be brought to eternal life. Faith is a gift that grows as we use it. Jesus quietly said, go your way, believing that all of your problems are taken care of. Our part is to go our way, to trust him, to do what he says. If desperate circumstances bring us to Jesus, then those circumstances are a gift from God to usher us into his very presence. Holy Spirit, help us to think about just how close are we to Jesus in our faith. Our greatest gift is salvation. And if you've never believed in Jesus, right now is the best time to do it. Just pray this with me. Dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. That I never believed in Jesus. I believe now that he is the son of God. Who had all of these miracle powers. But the greatest power was his death and resurrection from the cross over the grave to save me from my sins. I believe that when I die, I will go to heaven. This day, I commit my life to Jesus. And when he says for me to go, I will go and trust him along the way. Believers, this moment we were given another opportunity to recommit our faith to focusing on the sovereign hand of God. Come to Jesus to rededicate your walk, to strengthen you so that your walk of faith is one that when Jesus says to go, we don't see how, but we'll go anyway. We trust in Jesus anew. And if you and I have taught beforehand and the Holy Spirit has you ready to be a member to serve Jesus through our church, this would be a time to do so. We pray in the very strong name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you all for being here today and for joining us on, online. I look forward to us being together Tuesday night at our recording of our midweek devotion. I'll ask our ushers to come and escort us out. Thank you.